Right then, look at that, 9.29. For the first time in eight episodes, I'm actually early. But that's because I've been waiting for this since about 3.30 this morning when my um, eldest woke up and said, I need some water on the intercom. And I couldn't really get much, much to sleep again since then. But anyway, so welcome to episode eight. Um, and uh, another reason I was very excited about 3.30 this morning is we got our first guest on um, today. Um, and if you've seen um, the advertising for this, then um, it is none other than Rosie Sexton. Good morning, Sharon Headley, who will be joining us very shortly. Um, first of all, before we get into Rosie, then uh, I just want to reiterate my thanks for the feedback I've had um, for these. Um, it all started off as just a way of talking about my experiences when I was working over in Nairobi and Kenya. And I thought, what better way to talk about it than actually kind of face to face and since then, it's just kind of grown, um, which is great. Um, I've given you seven episodes where I've kind of tried to share just the way I think and the way I tick over, and um, both for therapists and, and for runners um, and triathletes and morning Ian. And just and the feedback's been great. One of the nicest bits of feedback, all feedback is great, but one of the nicest bits of feedback I've had has been um, um, you kind of make complex issues easy to understand okay which was great that came from a, a coach um who i've got the utmost respect for and he just said like sometimes i'm trying to get points across um to to my um, runners and you know you get that stage where they're just looking at you with a dropped jaw and blank face and he said and you kind of give me the tools to be able to get that across so everyday runners layman can understand what we're trying to achieve so that was fantastic so yeah so thank you very much for the feedback and um hopefully we'll just go from strength to strength now, especially with um, Rosie, who's going to be joining us shortly. I anyway, think. Well, let's give she... Rosie an intro, um, an intro before she's actually here. So, for those of you who haven't um, heard of um, Rosie before, then basically uh, we're talk. I can't big her up enough. We're talking about a pioneer um, of women's mixed martial arts, um, once ranked number one in the world. Okay, so let that kind of sink in. Um, we're looking at um, not only the first female fighter from Britain to fight in the UFC, um, which is kind of the one of the biggest um, promoters of um, mixed martial arts um, in the universe at the moment. She was also the first female fighter way back in 2002 to fight on Cage Warriors. Um, and over the next 10 years, hey Matt here, I'm just trying to join. Okay, hold on. I think I should be able to click on you like that. That's all right. That's all right. I'm here now. Um, <laughs> excellent. Okay. excellent. So fine. Um, I don't think we've lost oh. too many people. So thank you very much for joining us, eh? Yeah, it's great to speak to you, as always, as always. I um, think it, it definitely wasn't a technical issue at your end. What with your PhD in theoretical computer science <laughs> and all that? I can't blame well, it on you. My, my PhD was theoretical computer science with the emphasis on the theoretical. So uh, <laughs> I, uh, Modest as ever. So fixing, um, fixing things, it's uh, different. <laughs> Whilst I was ballsing things up this way, I've already kind of let people who aren't aware of your fighting history um, know about you and your history. Um, obviously, today the angle is more about the fact that since 2010, um, you have been an osteopath. Um, although predominantly my audience obviously is, is runners and that, mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping that because I often compare runners and their needs for injury prevention to martial artists in the sense that runners don't actually need to be touching their toes i kind of joke you never you shouldn't really be kicking people in the head during a marathon so why the hell are you <laughs> trying to stretch the hell out of your hamstrings so i thought that one of the great ideas as well as catching up with you again yeah. would be to maybe draw some parallels between working with a yes. runner who doesn't yeah. need that great range of flexibility and working with um, a mixed martial artist who i i imagine whether they obviously if they're kicking people here but even if you're grappling even if you're on the ground you're going to need a, a much greater range of movement than you're going to need sure uh, I mean, the, the, the demands are, are very different i think there's some it's interesting because there's there's some ways in which uh, the same considerations apply and then there's some ways in which it's very different so i think that's an, an interesting parallel to draw there okay so let's get the ball rolling with um Let's have a look. Some of the on that way on that kind of um, wave. What are some of the most typical injuries you see with mixed martial artists? What do you deal with in your clinic, and what have you experienced yourself? So people tend to think with mixed martial arts that you're going to see a lot of acute 
injuries, a lot of trauma sort of thing. Um, and you do get, we do get some of those. But I think as with most sports, the majority of what we tend to see in clinic tend to be um, more of the chronic overuse type injuries. I think they're really, really common with fighters. Um, I mean, as with uh, lots of top athletes, fighters tend to be prone to overtraining. Um, I think that's particularly true in mixed martial arts because there's so much to do on a technical, from a technical standpoint, it's uh, very easy to end up overtraining. I think I'd like, when I look at most fighters' training plans, um, look at those and go, how are you, how are you doing that? Um, and I, I mean, again, I think the answer is in, in many cases, um, yeah, there's there's a lot of strain on the body there. Um, it's uh, making a lot of compromises in order to get that level of, uh, of training. Um, and again, we tend to see that sort of boom and bust and with, with fighters so that they'll train really hard for a, an eight week fight camp. And then a lot of the time they'll, they'll take some time off um, and then go back into another fight camp. And that's where we tend to see a lot of the problems, I think. Um, that's really interesting. If I could just interrupt a sec, that's that's because in running, for example, it's, it's it's the research shows that in most cases of running injuries, it's down to a, um, inappropriate training. And we kind of mm -hmm. talk about the 2080 where. 80% of your running should be at kind of a three out of 10 um, perceived exertion and only 20% should be um, actually doing your intervals and your kind of faster stuff. Is there a, any research in mixed martial arts or a percentage of intense sessions and easier sessions, which you know about? So I think, um, I mean, mixed martial arts, there's a shortage of research generally because I mean, we're a relatively young sport. Um, there is some coming through now. There's, um, I so we're starting to see a little bit more, but I think if we can ex extrapolate from other sports, I think it's reasonable thing that I mean a lot of fighters are spending a lot too much of their time working at high intensity, and also there's a lot of um, a lot of the training tends to happen in that sort of middle intensity that grey zone, um, and as we know. I mean, really, for, for the most benefits, you want to be spending most of your time in that sort of easy zone with some intense intense work as well um, that middle zone tends to be where we see a lot of problems and what i see with with training is because of the nature of the technical work um we're seeing a lot of people spending too much time in that mid mid intensity area i think and i think that's one of the reasons um we tend to see a lot of overtraining issues um and I mean, I spend time talking to my fighters about um, planning their training and kind of the difference between the hard sessions and the easy sessions. I mean, something I think it's particularly difficult with the culture of mixed martial arts and fight sports. Um, there is something of a macho culture that goes along with it uh, that, uh, a, you know, go hard or go home. You know, I always train at 110 percent. You, you you see people posting these things and I, I mean m my angle is you know if you're if you're always training at 100 percent you're never training at 100 percent um you just think you are um yeah, yeah. that's good i'm gonna use that so you have a copyright that have you that's you great need, um you need to be doing some of your training um in that lower intensity zone so that you can peak um and i think that's that sort of understanding is really important i mean we're starting to get I mean, mixed martial arts, in some ways, is being dragged kicking and screaming into the 21st century. Um, I remember when I started, the, sort of back in the in the early 2000s, um, sports science kind of hadn't reached mixed, mixed martial arts or, or, or a lot of combat sports. Um, it was a lot of you'd hear people talking a lot about, oh, well, this is the way we did it when we were training, or this is the traditional way to do things, or um, you know, just lots of based on anecdotes and yeah, it's, it's, it's the new fad that's going around. And I mean, we still see some of that, but I think more and more we're seeing uh, certainly the top level guys starting to take on board the, um, the sports science advice and literature. And we're still starting to see a little bit more research coming through. So I'm hopeful that, you know, over the next decade or so, we're going to see um, a, a lot more, scientifically based training as That's opposed cool. to um yeah yeah i mean it's the same with running running research. Yeah. running research has only really been around since the yeah. 
80s when people started kind of realizing lots of people are getting injured so it's 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 young for running as well which is why we still haven't got a lot of the questions and i guess the same will, problems will face yeah. mma in the sense that it's very difficult to get a good study and yes. in the case of like whether it's retrospective um, or you know whether it's blind how do you get blinded trial with mma it's difficult enough with runners and stuff and yeah i mean it's, it's very very hard to do good research on these things and especially with mixed martial arts because um there's so much individual difference and there's you know if you look at how fighters fight there's so much difference between them um and you know what works for one person isn't necessarily going to work for somebody else there's differences in styles differences in body types um, i think one of the great things about mixed martial arts is that you can to some extent adapt your style to suit you so whereas with basketball for example there's a very clear uh, body type that works best you know you it's if you if you haven't got the height you're probably never going to make it as a top level basketball player i think in mixed martial arts there's a number of different body types that can work depending on your style and depending on how you fight um so it's finding the right style for that body type and that crosses over to the you know the strength of conditioning and how you want to prepare that person as well um so i'm not going to do the same things with all of my fighters i'm going to treat them very differently depending on those individual differences and i think having a study that actually allows for that that's going to be really hard so i think we've got there's a lot of challenges there um it's going to be interesting to see how that resolves itself that's really interesting as well because again it's an accentuation of what we see with runners i mean it's huge differences with with somebody going to to compete in an event in mixed martial arts but even when we get runners through who are going to compete in a marathon um or a half marathon or a park run we can't expect them all to run the same way so although Absolutely. it's a yes. it's less variance we still have to yeah. accept which brings me on to a ne next question um so um a mixed martial artist comes to you um mm -hmm. and they've got an injury and um, with a runner because we know that overtraining is such a, um, um, a mass has a massive impact and a key factor with potential causes of injuries. Um, it sounds like that if you're doing a case history with a, with a fighter, then you're definitely going to look at their training as well to see whether overtraining has, has, has been the cause. What are the factors? How much can you actually screen a fighter to, to either, well, I don't know whether you can prevent injury, but reduce the risks of injury. What sort of things do you look out for? I mean, I think the, the biggest factor from my point of view, and I mean, it, it, this is by a mile, the biggest factor is uh, overall strength. I think this is something I see. Um, if the fighters that do, uh, that have a good strength training plan as part of their, you know, they tend to be much less injury prone than the ones who don't. Um, I think that's that's the biggest pattern that I, I, I see with it. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean that fighter needs to be doing tons of strength training. It doesn't mean that, you know, that uh, we're not talking about necessarily being um, uh, absolutely strong compared to, say, you know, a power lifter or an Olympic weightlifter. Um, but having a good level of strength um, and being able to load those basic movements successfully, I think that's really important for fighters. Um, and in terms of building resilience, which is um, the, the main thing, it's that that's probably even more important than for, for performance. So when I get a fighter who's who comes in and tells me, oh yeah, I'm really injury prone, you know, I've got this, that, and the other going on, and they give me a long list of injuries. My first question, or one of my very early questions is gonna be, uh, what kind of strength training do you do? And very often they'll say, oh, well, I don't really do anything. Or, you know, I occasionally do a bit with the team, but I don't have a plan. And that's one of the things that we'll look at. I mean, I've got um, a, a strength coach who I work with, who's um, who does some work with, with a lot of my guys, is Chris Meir. He's fought himself. He's, he's going um, more into this strength coaching side of things now. And he works with a lot of the... Uh, the athletes who who come to me and a lot of the time when i've got somebody you know once i get people out of that initial um phase of rehab and they get we get them back to training a lot of the time i'll say well look you don't need to be coming in and seeing me every week let's get you on a strength plan let's get you doing some general work which is going to cover those bases and then i'm here if there's a problem you know that's that's how this should work it's not a question of you know coming in and having a bit of a rub down once a week necessarily 
this is all like i'm just sitting here my confirmation bias just i'm just <laughs> loving this totally i mean this is obviously why i invited you on sonny everything you're going to say was agree with everything i believe in so it's fantastic but it's again <laughs> it's, so, it's it's so applicable to runners as well because yeah. okay you might look at somebody who's going and fighting and thinking well obviously they've got to be strong because they're going to have people trying to pull their arms and legs off and they're going to have to yes. have that resilience yeah. but again it's it's I don't know whether it's difficult for you, but for runners, definitely runners seem to believe all they need is kind of cardiovascular fitness, especially distance runners, where again, we have to make them understand or help them understand that that hopping 1600 times from leg to leg over each mile demands a resilience and a strength yeah. and the whole basis of being to explode, which and running is a power, a power of exercise yes, is absolutely. based on strength. So with that in mind, then for my next confirmation bias, um, and I think this is going to be difficult. I'm, I'm kind of quite well known for telling runners and um, that they don't necessarily need as much flexibility as they believe. How big a factor is flexibility for fighters? I guess it depends on what type of fighter they are and background they've got. I mean, but generally, is, like? yeah, this is one of those that really does depend on um, the individual needs of that fighter, that individual needs analysis. Because I've got some fight. I mean, if if a fighter's style involves a lot of kicking for example a lot of head kicking um, they're going to need a whole different plan around those their hips compared to a fighter who's very i mean i get some fighters who are actually quite stiff they don't have a lot of flexibility but their style supports that and a lot of the time the the fighters who have who don't have so much flexibility they may have more explosive power for example so they're going to build their style that suits them um, and again, with the grapplers, you have grapplers who are very um, wrestling orientated, play a lot of top position. Um, and again, they, they often tend to be um, not quite so flexible necessarily. And then you've got a lot of the jiu-jitsu guys who are really super bendy. Um, and what each of those people needs is going to be different. For some of the guys who come in who are more flexible, I'm going to be saying, look, we need to look at being able to control those end ranges of movement. So we need more strength. Um, specifically towards that end range um, and then I've got other fighters who are maybe a bit too stiff they haven't got enough range of movement for what they want to do in which case we'll say yes we need we do need to work on mobility um, and so I mean I think I do prescribe stretching but I do it on a case-by-case -case basis and I target it to what that individual needs I don't just say go and spend an hour stretching um, and I think um, <laughs> When it comes to when it comes to mobility, static stretching that's that's one tool. I don't think it's the best way of developing mobility necessarily. I think um, again, depending on exactly what we're looking at, there are there are a whole range of different tools we can apply. Um, I mean, one of the things that I like is is loading the muscle into that end range, for example. So we'll do either. Um, isometrics towards that end range or even eccentrics going into that end range so one of my favorite tools for developing ham hamstring flexibility is actually the romanian deadlift um if i if i want to lengthen somebody's hamstrings i won't give them static hamstring stretches i'll give them romanian deadlifts um generally speaking so we don't need to static stretch to increase mobility you know, we, we can and sometimes it's appropriate but that's an individual thing. Now, I think there is a place for static stretching. And I tend to think that comes more in my recovery modalities. So when with fighters, one of the things we have is, um, one of the difficulties we have is recovery, especially in between training sessions. You know, there's so much high intensity work. And a lot of the time, there's a lot of, um, when you can particularly when you're competing at a high level there's a lot of stress and anxiety and you know comp competition pressure that goes along with that um i think from that point of view both on this on the psychological and the physical aspect of it uh, which link together i mean that you can't draw a draw a dividing line between those two things um i think looking and looking at recovery is really important and i think we you know when we're looking at things like um this is one of the reasons that I will look at cool downs with my fighters. It's not just in order to prevent soreness the next day or anything like that. Um, it's simply to get the body and the mind into a state where they're more likely to be able to recover and able to then go again 
she said, a lot of my fighters are training twice a day. So they're doing a session in the morning. They need to get that recovery in during the day and then again the evening. So doing a bit of static stretching, maybe some breathing exercises, um, some low intensity cardio as part of that cool down. Those things I, I find can be helpful, but that's more on a global level. That's I, te That tends to be not so much looking specifically at those individual muscles. It's more of a, um, a nervous system effect that I'm looking for. So I think there's, there is a place for that. And again, some people like static stretching. Some people, you know, some of my fighters come to me and they say, I do yoga and it makes me feel good. In which case I say, great, fantastic. You know, if, if that works for you and that's helping, then by all means go and do that. Because like I say, I think there are other benefits as well as, you know, purely the, um, the range of movement. But I think if we're, if we're just looking at range of movement, um, then static stretching is not the only tool in the toolbox. Okay, yeah, that's brilliant. No, I'm, um, I'm, I, I can um, appreciate all of that. And I think it's interesting that the, the distinction you made between um, stretching for performance, in which case you talked about the eccentric strength training, where really we're looking at mobility um, instead of yes. flexibility. And I yeah. have to make this distinction with, with runners because I think we kind of regard flexibility as a skill. Um, yeah. And I think we can probably blame yes, absolutely. Grand absolutely. Grand for this and kickboxing yeah. and all the original full contact when it's not really a skill. If you can do the splits, that's not going to make you a better kicker. Yeah. You know, I mean, again, the, the thing we've got to look at is, is if, if somebody has flexibility deficit, so they haven't got enough flexibility for what they want to be able to do, um, then obviously that's a relevant factor that we need to address. But then the question becomes, well, where is that lack of flexibility coming from? What's the problem here? Is it that the muscle is too short? And I mean, sometimes that might be the case, but a lot of the time I find that there's other things going on. So for example, um, with hip issues, sometimes with the fighters, there's a bony issue around the hip. So, you know, we've got a femoral tabular impingement type pattern, um, in which case all the stretching in the world um, isn't going to change. I mean, again, we're, we're, we're trying we're trying to fix the wrong problem. You know, stretching your adductors isn't going to change the bony morphology of your hip. Um, so, making sure that we're addressing the right problem, I think, is important. And sometimes you have to say to people, "Look, I don't think we're going to be able to get get you doing the splits. You know, we're not going to be able to get you with the range of motion that you you would like to have there." The question is, how do we adapt what you're doing to suit your body as much as, you know, we can adapt the body to some degree, but then we also have to look at, well, are there other ways of going about this? And I think sometimes when you, um, again, by improving motor control around these joints, improving strength, improving the ability of those muscles to function well at end range, um, we can get a good effect on functional mobility without necessarily increasing absolute mobility. Um, no, so... I agree. I often, I don't. Obviously, there's been no studies, but I do wonder whether, like, I remember when I started martial arts years ago, and obviously in a class we'd all start off with a bit of a warm up, and we'd be doing lots of static stretching and partner work and ballistic stretching, and and at the end when we were hot, we'd be doing loads of seated hamstring stretches and stuff. And I saw my flat. I was genetically, I was quite flexible anyway, but definitely I saw increases, but. I still wonder how much of those increases in flexibility, like let's take being able to kick high, for example, was a result of the static stretching we did, or whether it was just practicing kicking high, yeah. you know, yeah. kicking a high bag. It's, that's Absolutely, probably yeah. what taught the nervous system, as you've mentioned, yeah. to actually handle that. It's the same as looking high. If you don't look high, then you'll kick low. I think maybe that probably has more of an effect than the lying down and pulling somebody between your legs and expecting the muscle yeah. to change. I, I think Again, it, I think it very much depends on depends on the case. You know, I, I see people who come to my clinic, and I sometimes I often say, "Yeah, actually, we do need you." That person would benefit from increasing muscle length. So, again, the extent to which we can do that that's another that's another difficult question because I mean, we know that it's it's not necessary. Increasing absolute muscle length is hard, um, as we can increase tolerance to stretch. Yeah, that's a, that's a whole different thing, um, but uh, but again, you know, there's we're looking at 
eccentrics over time. And again, it's the sort of thing we'd, we're not necessarily going to make a very quick change to this. It's something which if we put that into their program, over time we'll see some benefit to that. Um, but again, a lot of the time it's about trying to get that person functioning better with the range that they're using or with the range that they've got. So again, I mean, with, we see this a lot with shoulders, of course, you know, if um, it's not just about being able to get the shoulder into that position, it's about being able to, it's having control of it while it's there and being able to use that range well. Um, which I think is, uh, that sometimes gets neglected when we're just purely looking at the flexibility side of it. Um, so, I mean, I, I see people still sometimes doing these old school stretching exercises, you know, where they're sort of having somebody jumping up and down on their legs and, you know, trying to force them into the splits and things like that. You know, it's like, it's, again, there is a time and a place for static stretching. But we've got to be very careful that we're actually addressing the right problem. Um, mm -hmm. Ah, fascinating. Okay, so um, what about tell me about because you've got your own osteopathy practice in Solihull, um, which is Alton is the name. Yes, Alton Alton Osteopathy. Yeah. Um, so how does that tally in with because you've also got your online combat sports therapy website? Um, yes. So how did one work with the other and? What's the difference between the two? Or? So my, my in-person um, clinic, you know, where, where people can come and see me, that's Alton Osteopathy. That's my, and I, um, I treat everyone, you know, not just combat sports athletes. I do see a lot of combat sports athletes. That's probably about 30% of my caseload um, is people who are involved in combat sports in some way or another, which is obviously, you know, relative to most practitioners, that's high, but that's all, that also leaves a lot of other people, you know, from other sports and, and also, um, you know, your, your people who might be more generally associated with osteopaths. So, you know, the, Older, older population, um, maybe, uh, I mean, I, I see some of the more complicated kind of back pain medical, um, people with other medical issues going on as well. So I, I really enjoy treating a wide range of different people. I don't want to get pigeonholed into, I just do combat sports. Um, having said which, um, I really enjoy treating combat sports athletes and I like doing the the late stage rehab i think that's something that's really lacking for um it's very hard to, as a combat sports athlete myself my experience was it's very hard to find a practitioner who understands the sport well enough and strength and conditioning well enough and as well as having that background with the injury management and treatment side of things it's very difficult to find somebody who can put all of those things together and give you a really good late stage rehab plan to get you back to doing what you want to do i tend to find that there's a bit of a gulf between you know the early stage rehab which gets you you know getting people out of pain getting them back to normal activities of everyday life and then getting people back to um hitting each other in a cage or whatever that whatever sport is they're going to go and do um so the bit that i really enjoy if you like is trying is is finding a path from one to the other and, and looking at that zone in the middle and that's where i see so many so many fighters you know fall into that gap in between the in two things you know they've got a strength and conditioning coach um who can prepare them for sport and they've got a physiotherapist who can who gets them out of pain but there's there's no coordination between those two things. There's no link between those two things, and I think that's um, that's the bit that a lot of people would benefit from having. And so yeah. that's, well, that's where that's I set up Combat Sports Clinic was to was to look at that angle and to sort of look at okay, well, how do we get people not just out of pain but back to doing the sport they want to do? Um, and I mean, so many of my fighters come to me and say. Uh, I went to a physio and they just told me to stop doing it. All right. you, if, if that's your first answer if, to somebody, then you shouldn't be treating them. You know, you, I mean, by all means, just admit that you don't have the the level of knowledge or the sort of to to help that person, but don't tell them, oh, you can't do this. 
you know and again a lot of the time i'm seeing this with even relatively straightforward injuries that actually don't take a lot of um intervention you know it's something that we can uh, things that we can manage relatively easily but people are just saying that sounds a bit scary that sounds a bit risky it's out of my experience level L just don't do it um and I, f I find that really frustrating um I think that's the strength of any, no pun intended, but the strength of any therapist is the trouble is we're taught our courses and courses when there's different careers and different names. And still, I think your, your courses don't like to encroach on the strength and conditioning or the personal training. And they kind of stick to what their trade is to protect the trade and also not kind of pretend yeah, something I think, they're not. But I you, mean, need, is, you need both. This is the thing that I see with, um, I mean, one of the advantages of science um, and the, the scientific approach to all these things is it's quite reductionist. So we, we look at a small area of a problem and we analyse that and we break it down and we end up with more detailed knowledge about that than we can get by looking at the whole picture at once. But the problem is, at some stage, you then have to put all those little bits of knowledge back into the overall picture. And I think that's what we have to do as clinicians is try, forming an overall picture from all those little pictures, sort of a, a mosaic, if you like, and being able to integrate that together. And sometimes we, some of these pictures contradict each other. And sometimes we, we have gaps where we don't have anything that goes in there. Um, and sometimes we have to look at an individual case and we don't know exactly what's going to work for that individual because we haven't done a study on that particular individual and all the factors that are relevant to them you know we, we can look at averages across the pop population um but when it comes to that person who sat in front of you we have to be able to integrate all these different bits of information we've got and come up with a plan that's going to help that person or that's our, our best shot if you like is something that's going to help that person and that's, I think, where the, the skill of the clinician comes in. Um, and this is where the difference between being a researcher and working with patients is we have to look at that from so many different angles at once. Um, and I, I always say to people, sometimes we don't know the best answer. We, In terms of a scientific answer, you know, I can't prove that this is going to be the best approach. All I can say is that from everything I know, putting all of those um, individual pieces of the puzzle together, this is my best guess at the moment. So let's go with this. Let's create a plan and let's get feedback on that plan. And we can adjust that as we go along. And I think, um, again, being able to deal with that uncertainty and communicate that uncertainty as well, because I think, as clinicians, we don't say, I don't know, nearly often enough. You know, I think a lot of the time, you know, we like to come across as very sure of ourselves and very, you know, we know this, we know that. Um, and again, I think there's a, there's a skill in communicating that to the patient and being able to say, well, look, here's what the evidence says. Here's my experience. This is what I think will work best for you. But as your part of that, I need you to give me really good feedback about what's going on. I don't want you to just come in and say, yes, everything's great. That's not what I'm asking you. I need you to, tell, to, to give me detailed feedback on what's working well, where you're still having problems, what's going on here, what you're doing. Um, and then we're going to put all of those things together in, and we're going to use that to adjust the plan as we go. So that's a whole different thing i think from um um from just being able to pull a a, a a study off pubmed that supports your view about you know whatever it happens to be i think too much of the time i think we've i mean the internet is a great thing because it's um given us access to so much more information i think the, the negative side of that there is one is that information doesn't necessarily equal understanding and now anyone can go on google and say oh i found a study that proves my point about whatever because you can find a study that will support pretty much any view you like um, if you look carefully enough 
that doesn't necessarily the skill comes in being able to interpret that being able to interpret that in the context of the individual and this is why we still need experts mm -hmm. That's, that's, well, that's my rant today. Um, no, no, that's <laughs> amazing. It's all music to my ears. So it's it's it sound, it's it's warming to me to hear another professional saying this because it it backs up this. There's sometimes there's this fear when we're kind of trying to persuade other therapists, particularly new therapists, that this whole idea that we're not really operators anymore, as as per the papers and Silverman and and Jacobs, we're not operators. We're facilitators. Okay, we help people. We work with people, not on people. Um, and yes. that kind of goes against a lot of the skills which are taught, especially a lot of the manual therapy techniques. Essentially, they were working on people. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I love about watching your, because you've just released your Next Strength Masterclass video. Um, and um, one of the things I love on it is it reminded me that as clinicians, sometimes there's this worry that if we're not going to pamper people, then we should be, like you say, go away, do this by yourself. But there's a whole load of um, things which you show on the video of how you can work with the client, um, for example, with the isometric exercises, adding the resistance where you're not doing things to the client anymore, but you're actually working with them to increase their confidence, to take them through the rehab properly um, and not too rushed. And mm -hmm. that's that's your time. And that's something where because there's this fear, I think, at the moment where new clinicians are thinking so you're telling me that i should only see them once a month once they start to get better and because i'm not going to do any manual therapy there's on your video you show there's a whole load of ways which therapists who have got great communication skills who understand their trade who understand strength and conditioning can support clients and work with them and basically make a living it's not that we're going to have absolutely, to go part-time it's just I mean, changing what we do I'll, I'll quite openly say i mean i use manual therapy i do manual therapy i find it useful as part of an overall picture but it's only a part of what i do it's only a part of what i do and my the, the way i use that tends to be in quite an active and involved way so um i will i will integrate that into the exercises for example movements i'll get clients involved in doing those movements um i mean my hands-on work tends to be quite active um on the part of the client as well so um and then i use that together with the with the exercises getting them doing more on their own starting to build into things that they can take away with them and i always say to people my goal is to keep you out of my clinic i mean, I'll, I'll say that quite openly in the nicest possible way i want to keep you out of my clinic as much as possible now if somebody wants to come in for a treatment because it makes them feel better and it helps them with what they're doing and and they like it great fantastic um i have no problem with somebody booking in i have a few clients who come in on a regular or a semi-regular basis just because they they like that they find it useful um i'm not going to try and dissuade anyone from doing that but i always say that should be because you want to and not because you need to yeah i want to give people the tools that they can manage things themselves that they can go away they know what they should be doing um and they they can take that away with them and then I'm here if there is a problem. You know, if something goes wrong, if they need a bit more guidance, if something isn't quite working out for them, that's when we can, we can troubleshoot. Um, and actually, that's a bit for me as a clinician, that's far more interesting than just getting people in for another rub down. Um, you know, like I say, I mean, I, I, I love working with clients. I love seeing them. You know, I, I like doing the hands on work. But for me, the bit that um, gets me out of bed in the morning if you like the bit that i really enjoy that's the it's the problem solving um mm -hmm. and it's figuring out what's going to help that particular individual in front of me and um like i say you know i this is why i i, I think the sorry about that um this is why <laughs> I the exercise prescription side of things um and again it's it's not just a case of handing out sheets of exercises to people. It's about being really creative and finding the the right exercise that's going to work for that person at that time, and then finding a way to help them fit that into their life so that they're actually going to do it. And there's there's so much that we can do in that space there um, that I think it's just. I mean. I remember having a lecturer at university who used to tell us, you know, you can you can teach it, you, you can teach a chimp to do manual therapy. You can, you know, you could, um, 
just doing the hands-on side of things that's not where the skill is the skill is in the decision making and um and in the communication and putting the plan together and and all of those things so i think it's it's a much bigger um th there's much more to this job than than just getting people in for a bit of a rub um and like i say that's not to say that there's anything that that can't be a part of what we do but it's a small part it's you know it's it's not the whole thing by any means and like i say i i i don't like absolutes i think you know we start saying always and never um because reality is more complicated than that you know um i think uh, it's a question of it's always a question of finding what's right for that that particular person in front of us um Brilliant. yeah that's excellent and uh, that's such valuable information for both therapists and for patients out there so that um patients know what to expect and if they're with somebody who's just kind of doing things onto them and they're not actually asking them or getting them to do things as well i think diane jacobs put it lovely in a very simple way that basically her time with a patient or client is a bit like a sandwich where the manual therapy she does will be in the in the middle but she's mm -hmm. always got kind of back on the outside which will be the education and the movement you've got to surround yeah, any form of manual yeah. therapy yeah. I mean, that's, that's a good way of looking at it you know, I mean, I always say that, I mean, I, I often combine the, the manual therapy with talking to people about what's going on. Um, I mean, because again, it's a really good way to educate people on things like anatomy, for example, because if you can get hands on with that patient, you can show people, you know, uh, well, look, see, this movement is, or this muscle or this joint, and you can explain to people what's going on with that joint or what might be going on with that joint and what's going on with the nervous system and how different things that we do may affect that. Um, and again, it's, it's, it becomes more of a practical demonstration rather than just explaining it in, in dry terms to somebody sat across a desk from you. Um, so, I mean, again, that's another way that you can use the manual therapy to integrate with the, with the education, for example, and then, you know, getting people doing the exercises, doing the movements. So you, a lot of the time, if I've got somebody in pain, you could start by help assisting that movement, doing that movement with them, and you can build into them doing it by themselves, or you know, you combining the. I mean, I, I I like to combine soft tissue work and movement, for example. I think that's uh, again, I find that that works quite well. Um, again, then taking that into something that that person can take away with them and do. Um, so. Like I say, I think all of these things blend into each other at the edges, and it's often those um, those border those boundaries between different um, different areas, if you like. So rather than dividing it into, you know, you've got your manual therapy, you've got your education over here, you've got your exercise over here. Um, rather than having those as different things, you know, it's the places they blend into each other. That's where things get interesting, I think. Yeah, and um, I think indeed yeah. that's the that's the future of kind of therapies. We know it where I think yeah. margins or boundaries are going to start blurring because there's the idea we can work very close with a strength and conditioning coach, and there'll still be places for that. But once you're in that clinic yeah. room and someone's coming to you in pain, you're going to need to be a little bit of a jack of a few trades to truly be able yes. to serve them. Yeah. Um, okay, so. Um, I mean, that's a lot of what you've said. I picked up from your video. I love the anatomy presentations. I love the videos of you showing um, the progressions in particular, the isometric and the eccentric and the concentric. Um, and then not just finishing there, what you said, the end rehab, showing the power and the functional movement and stuff. Tell us a little bit more about that um, video and online course and who you think it will benefit. So, I mean, the Neck Strength Masterclass, the original inspiration for this was actually my own neck injury um, because I prolapsed two discs in my neck at different times. I know exactly when I did it. Um, I remember both of the occasions um, and it was going in for a takedown. Uh, head got pushed off to one side, uh, stinger down the arm. So shooting pain down the arm, numbness in the fingers um, and then... It developed from there, basically. So, was this in training? Or excuse me, was this in training or in a fight? It was in training. It was in training, in training both times. Um, yeah. And I sort of had increasing problems with with this going through my career. So by the time I got to, towards the end of the career, my career, um, I there was I was having to avoid things in training and avoid things in competition because I wasn't confident that my neck was going to hold up. Um, if I did it and again I, I, I mean I, I worked with some 
some very good therapists and excellent medical professionals um, managed to get through the, that training and that, those competitions, like I say, which I think is a credit to their skill. But the thing that I always found difficult was getting back, getting the neck strong enough to do what I do. Um, and what I found is that a lot of the neck rehab that is out there um, you know, is for fighters just massively underloaded. Again, it's it's like it's like bringing a banana to a gunfight. Um, you know, it's um, I would say it's a, it's a little bit like doing tai chi. There's nothing wrong with doing tai chi. It's great, but it's not going to help you in a mixed martial arts fight. And I think the same is true with a lot of this, um, the, the neck rehab that I was seeing. It's like there's a massive gap between the load you're putting on the neck with a rehab and the load your neck's going to be experiencing in a fight. Um, and we've got to find some way of bridging that gap. And I talked to lots of people about this and nobody had a really comprehensive plan for doing that. I mean, I picked up ideas from a lot of different people. You know, I think... Um, Along the way, I, I, I borrowed from all sorts of places, but nobody had, you know, a comprehensive idea of, right, how do we get you from here to where you need to be? Um, and this is something that sort of, after I retired, I've, I've seen a lot of fighters with similar neck problems. The one that really got me, um, got me properly um, putting all this together, so I had um, a fighter who came to see me in April, um, he had a similar injury to the one I'd had. He'd prolapsed three discs in his neck. He'd spent three days in hospital. Um, he couldn't. Uh, when I when I first saw him, he had a lot of weakness and numbness in his in his arm. Um, he was. Uh, I mean, he'd been. I think he'd been recommended surgery, but wanted to try and avoid that. So when I first saw him, he was in bits, um, and he said to me, "I, I want to fight." So the question is, okay, well, how do we get you from here to over, right over there? Um, and this is where I sort of started putting, really putting all of this together. So, I mean, obviously the first thing is you need to get him out of pain. You need to get him moving around, just doing everyday basic things. Um, and again, to the point where he's off the painkillers even. I mean, that's the, that's the first step. Um, and then from there, we gradually got to rebuild that strength. We've got to get him back. So not only so that his neck is strong enough to do that, but he's got the confidence that it's strong enough so that he's not thinking twice. Because when you go in, in a fight, if you're going to shoot for a takedown or something like that, the second you th think about it, the second you have that thought in your head, you've lost it. You've, you've got to be just able to, to, to do that without without thinking twice so that was that was the challenge and i think that's where i um it, that was the inspiration if you like for for putting this out as a video because i mean I, I started working with them I, I i put a few clips online and i got loads of people coming, um messaging me and saying can you can you help you know can you when's the video coming out if you like um you know, so, uh, so that's where it came from. <clears throat> and again, the idea is that, I mean, everything that I did with this fighter is is in the video. Um, I mean, I say on the on the video, what I say is that it should be if you've got a neck injury, it's important to use that in conjunction with the advice of a, a physiotherapist or somebody who who can look at you individually. So, um, having somebody who can who can tell you what's appropriate at what stage that's that's important i think um but in absolute terms everything that i did realistically from from an exercise point of view um is on there so it's it's just a question of gradually progressing through from those very basic mobility drills and isometrics to putting more load on to reacting to external forces um is that's the, the that's an important thing um to being able to absorb collision forces and i mean <clears throat> ultimately when you look at a contact sport the neck is a is a collision absorber you know it's it, it functions to um or the neck muscles function to slow down those 
those impacts. Um, so we have to be the neck. We have to make sure that those muscles are able to function in that way when they need to in response to those external forces. And I think I've seen you describe it in a interview or something is like the fifth limb which i thought was again was a nice analogy yes. yeah, you yeah. think of arms well, and legs is all we need but this is again a yeah something we yeah. look after. and so. again when, when you think about how much time and energy we put into um training and doing strength work for arms legs i mean even the lower back you know we talk about core muscles um but when we think about necks I mean, even fighters, a lot of the time, don't spend a lot of time on the necks. They do a, a few very basic things. But again, they tend, most of them tend not, they tend either not to be loaded heavily enough or they tend to be not very well thought out and not very specific. So things like the head harness work that I see a lot of people doing. Um, I mean, almost universally, it, it's it's terribly done. Mm. It's, uh, it just becomes just, like a bicep curl for the neck exactly that exactly that um it's it's not done very well um with inappropriate loads and inappropriate movement patterns and again a lot of the time i find that it, it reinforces um unhelpful movement patterns so for fighters we don't want them sticking their chins out um i mean one because it makes it a bigger target it increases the the leverage so if you get hit on the chin it's going to have a bigger impact um and also because the the neck doesn't function as well in that position to resist those external forces so we don't want we don't want to be putting people in that position a lot of the time when you see people doing these head harness exercises that's exactly where they're going with it you know the the, the chin's coming right out they're extending the back of the neck uh, so that's not what we want to be training that's not how we want to be training it. Um, and again, it's we want to be training the muscles in the way that they're going to be used. So we want to be able, we, most of the time for necks, we're not, we don't need to be able to do lots of curls like this. That's not how we use the neck. The way we use the neck is to, is for deceleration most of the time, it's to slow down movements or it's to transmit forces from other, that are generated in other parts of the body. So if we're, pushing off from the legs, for example, and, and, and driving our opponent with the head and shoulder. That's a case where we're using the neck isometrically um, to transmit the forces we've generated elsewhere. So when we train the neck, we want to be training it in, the, in that way. So we're using it specifically. Um, and I think when we start talking about the kind of forces that are involved in combat sports, a lot of therapists get a bit nervous about this and they come from going, that's but 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 it's a neck it's a neck yeah. and there's this yeah. conception that necks are, are fragile and we need to be careful with them and i mean yes on the one hand they've got a lot of vital structures in them but also they're a really robust piece of kit and they need to be because otherwise we wouldn't survive you know if the neck was as fragile as a lot of therapists seem to believe we wouldn't be here um mm -hmm. so we've got I mean, the function of those neck muscles is is to protect all of those vital structures. And we need those to be working effectively. We need especially need those to be working effectively when we've got somebody who's going to be putting themselves in all those positions. So, yes, there is. I mean, with any intervention, there is always a risk involved. We need to be we, we need to be careful. We need to be safe. We need to be um, listening to patient feedback. We need to do all of those things. But at the same time. I always maintain that doing that strength work with the neck is much safer than not doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's great. The last point. thing you want to do, if you're going to put people in that position where they're going to be experiencing those forces and they're going to be doing those things with their neck and you haven't conditioned them, that's when there's a, there's a real problem. Yeah, that's brilliant. And there's, um, again, like, I almost started this this um, web chat thinking that there's going to be more differences between preparing a martial artist to, to for for a runner or reducing injury risk. But again, there's so many parallels with what you're saying yes. about the importance of eccentric strength, of uh, end stage rehab. Um, so I'm hoping that runners who watch this video um, probably they're going to be interested in martial arts as well, so they'll be able to draw on those parallels as well. But just think about um, 
strengthening muscles in and how they work when you're actually moving so like the quads in running are primarily there as opposed to propulsion they're there to decelerate when you land when you're going to mid stance so your training can't be just always quick drops to the floor you've got to think of the eccentric angle and everything so we're coming up to well an hour uh, which i knew was going to happen um we could easily talk for another hour let's um how can people um if people are interested in your neck uh, strength masterclass, where do they go to so um we've got a website combat sports clinic.net um and there's uh, you can sign up on there um we we occasionally send emails out to people with uh, details of uh, new products and things like that so mm -hmm. um get involved there's going to be a um we're just setting up a forum on there at the moment so there's going to be some interaction um so that's a that's a good place to go we also have a social media presence um on facebook is combat sports clinic page um there's we're on twitter as combat underscore clinic and instagram as combat sports clinic so uh, look us up um I, I try to post little snippets of you know videos and things that i've been doing um you know, I share relevant articles and things like that so come join in the discussion and uh, it'd be great to hear from anyone who's got an interest in in that area i mean for therapists as well i'm always very interested to talk to therapists who are interested in treating um fighters and combat sports athletes because i mean i often get asked for recommendations so i often get fighters from different parts of the country best me to go who can i go and see or what can i do about this so if i know that there's somebody in an area who's got a particular interest in that um that's always a useful contact for me to have and again um i sometimes get therapists messaging me asking about oh i've got this fighter who's just come to see me um what should i do about x or you know and, and just wanting to talk through what they can do to help that person and i'm always very very happy to do that you know if any therapists want to get in touch just for a bit of that sports specific angle on things um I'm, I'm very happy to sort of share what i know with that and to help people out so i think that's um again you know that that's good for everyone if we if we can de develop those those networks that's brilliant. Well, I'll make sure I'll put you the links to your various social media outlets um, in the comments sheet under this. I mean, I've got to say you gave me a copy of the um, course to have a look at. And it's funny because, I mean, obviously, it's a really extensive, long course. It's amazing um, value for money. But I stopped at 27 percent because I was thinking like and I love the reminders you get. Dear Matt, you haven't completed blah, blah, blah. And that was brilliant. But suddenly at 27 percent, I thought. I can't rush this. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna rush it just so I can see what's yeah. left in it because it was like I'm. I'm getting stuff out of this myself. So I recommend even therapists who aren't yeah. necessarily working with martial artists, but um, are working even if it's not just about neck. The way you lay it down and you explain the importance of progression and the different stages and the different types of muscle contraction and the power and the anatomy. I think it's a. And I'm not just saying it because it's you. I think it's a valuable read or watch for. For anybody for therapists as well as um, obviously martial artists um oh, so i'm, I'm no, really great. glad that and you really professionally done that um i mean one thing that we're looking at doing in the future is is getting a, a cpd course together for therapists who want to look at the neck particularly with relation to contact sports because again i think it's an area that a lot of therapists are a little bit nervous about um and don't really uh, again the, the, there's a lack of knowledge about what they can do to help um so this is something that I, I really want to put together because I think it would be valuable information. Oh, amazing. Um, and eventually we're also going to look at doing a clinical companion for the next strength masterclass. So for therapists who are interested in it, there's a little bit of extra background there um, and some information about how they can use these things in clinic with their patients. That's great. So they can sign up to your newsletter if they want to keep in touch with information about that. Mm -hmm. If you want to come down the South Coast and obviously... The, op the uh, um, offer is always down here to come and use our facilities if you're looking to do some CPD Absolutely. in the south. Um, but look, I've got Sunday at 11 o'clock and it's 10.37. <laughs> I work on Sundays. Absolutely. So, um, Rosie, I just want to say thank you again so much. It's been, we could, I could easily listen to you for another hour. Um, one of the great comments I heard from, because I'm seeing all of the comments from the people in the room underneath. I've had things like, why is Rosie so small and you're so big? She's the star, which I thought was a valid point. <laughs> you know, I've got to try and find a way of splitting this screen so it's even. 
and um, when I've got especially people of your caliber and, and, and knowledge um, talking, oh, that's right. um, there's loads I of like highs from people, people underneath. Far. I'm going to have to have a little look through. There's people with um, some great names and people from Australia and people who've got a lot of love in the room for you, Rosie. So Aww. thanks again so much for coming down. I wish you all the luck with your um, Next Strength Masterclass video and everything else you're doing. And and thank you for being such a great osteopath as well um, because it's it's great. I think you should be a, a good representative for your industry because it defeats a lot of these um, myths we've got over osteopaths, chiropractors, and all these stereotypes, because obviously you're not, you're not just a, got one bag of tools. You're looking at the whole picture of like every therapist should be. So thank you very much again. Thanks a lot, Matt. And thanks everyone for listening and um, catch you soon. Okay. We'll see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Um, so that's um, Rosie Sexton. I hope you enjoyed um, that. I hope there's parallels for everybody who's watching and people who watch the recording. Um, it's going to be an hour long, which I'll warn you about when I post it live and the recording. And we're going to be back next week. We've got another, um, well, we've got somebody who's going to have some big shoes to fill after that hour. But um, somehow I think he will be um, able to fill a little bit of those shoes with his little feet. But I'll let you know later on who that's going to be. So, um, right, we've got to go. Thank you very much again, everybody. And um, thank you again to Rosie. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.